before I say anything, the most important thing I should mention is everything we did that night was supposed to just be a joke, all in good fun or whatever. I mean, there's no way we could have predicted what would happen. We never would have done it if we knew someone was going to get hurt, and we never meant to cause any harm to anyone, but unfortunately that's exactly what happened. Me and my friends, who we'll call Ren and Oliver, were trying to figure out what we wanted to do for Halloween. We were all 15 and figured that that meant that we were too old for trick-or-treating, but we also didn't want to stay in all night. Halloween was on a Friday that year, which meant all of our curfews were later than during the week, so we wanted to spend that extra time out during the most fun night of the year doing something that was exciting at the very least. What we came up with was cruel, but at the time we thought it would be funny. If anything, it turned out to be scary for us and the person we had decided to target. We lived in a relatively big city in the suburbs. Ren, Oliver, and I lived in the same neighborhood as each other and a few blocks away from us lived a hoarder. And not the kind of hoarder that keeps everything confined to their house. This lady's whole property was full, like at least six feet high piles of garbage on her lawn and in her backyard. It even piled up against the fence next to her neighbor's yard. We all knew who she was, but no one saw her very often. The news tried to interview her a few times about the mess, but she always refused. We thought it was probably because she must have been embarrassed by what her house had become. And our plan went like this. We'd sneak around her house as best we could and knock on the doors and windows, shake the doorknobs, make ghost-like sounds. Whatever we could do to scare her a little. I know you're probably thinking this was just mean and I wish I had some excuse for our actions, but... I really don't. Anyway, once it was dark outside, I met up with Ren and Oliver and in costume, we all headed for our house. A few people asked what we were dressed as and the only answer we could come up with was bank robbers since we were all dressed in black with stupid tights over our faces. I was mentally cringing at how ridiculous we must have looked. Looking back, I really should have been cringing at what we were about to do. We got to her house and I was already nervous. For the sake of the story, I'll call the woman Emily. When we walked into her yard, we were met with a smell I could only describe as garbage and death. It was so bad, I even begged the other guys for us to find something else to do because I thought I was going to puke through the tights covering my face. I was gagging, but they just told me to suck it up. We tried looking through her window to see if she was inside, but there was no way we were going to be able to see anything. It was blocked with garbage on the inside. We could hear what sounded like a TV inside, so we took that as proof that she was in there. Ren said the first thing that we should do was each of us go to different windows around the house and begin knocking to try to spook her. I went around to the backyard, which was a journey through garbage and rotting food. I was regretting every moment we were there, but I didn't want to ask to leave again. I didn't want the guys to think that I was a loser or chicken or whatever, so... I got to the back sliding glass door that led to the kitchen and began knocking. As I knocked, I watched inside the house and saw movement coming from the room just outside my view. Making her way through the garbage and toward the door I was standing at was Emily. I hadn't actually seen her in years and actually gasped when she stumbled into view. She looked horrible, and when I say horrible I don't mean ugly. She looked sick, like physically ill. There were dark bags under her eyes and she easily gained at least 150 pounds since the last time I saw her. Her clothes were extremely dirty and she obviously hadn't showered in who knows how long. I stood there still for a moment before realizing I needed to hide. Only my feet were caught in the trash that I was standing in and no matter how hard I tried to move, there was no way I could get out of there before she saw me. Then I heard a knock at her front door. She must have too, since she turned in the other direction towards it. I was relieved. Oliver climbed over to me to ask what I was doing when I told him I was stuck. We started to get a little worried. Ren came over to see what we were both doing, and both of them decided the funniest thing to do would be to leave me there and see if she caught me. Some friends they were, I guess. They pounded on the back door and ran out of view as I watched Emily make her way toward me, climbing over the trash in her own home before she opened the sliding glass door and grinning this awful grin. When she saw me there, struggling to get up and get away from her, she giggled, like the kind of giggle a little girl does when she gets a doll for Christmas. It was like this lady had superhuman strength the way she picked me up 
and pulled me out of the trash heap. She practically dragged me inside as I squirmed and begged her to let go and that I was sorry. I kept screaming for my friends to help me. I looked back at them as they watched her bring me further and further into her house until I couldn't see them anymore. They looked scared for me too and all I could do was hope that they would go and get some help. After dragging me through the filth in her house, she brought me to what I assumed was once her living room and sat me down in her fat, feces-covered sofa. The smell in her home was even worse than outside. I was gagging and gagging and no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't hold it in. I threw up all over myself. The first thing she said to me was something that gave me chills. In a voice I could only describe as one someone uses when they talk to their baby, she said, Oh honey, let mommy clean that up for you. You spit up on yourself again. God, I was freaked out. She waddled her way into another room and came out with the dirtiest towel I'd ever seen and as she got closer to me, I just started to cry. She brought the towel up to my face and wiped my mouth and clothes until she said it was clean. I could smell what was on the towel and it only made me throw up once again. She didn't seem to notice, or she pretended not to, since this time she didn't clean me up. Instead, she sat beside me and grabbed me, placing me on her lap as she cradled me. I shoved and kicked, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get away. I just kept begging her to let me go. After what felt like forever, she set me back down to sit on the sofa as she got up and left the room once again. This time, she came back with the corpse of a dead cat. I wanted to cry when she set it on my lap and told me it liked me and wanted to be petted. There was absolutely no way that was going to happen though. After what felt like hours, but was actually probably only 30 minutes of being in that house, I heard sirens. The relief that came over me when I heard the police knocking on the door was insane. She answered and when they asked if I was inside, she told them the only person in her house with her was her baby. They told her they needed to check to make sure and after they rounded the pile of garbage blocking me from their view, it was obvious I wasn't her baby. They told me to get up and come with them but she didn't like that idea at all. She started screaming that they couldn't take her baby. She rushed in front of me and wouldn't let me go. They kept telling her to step aside but she wouldn't and when one of them took a step close, she charged forward. One of the officers yelled, Taser, 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 and within seconds, she was on the ground. Well, she was in the garbage, but for the purpose of the story, I'll just call it the ground. They arrested her and got me out of the house into the hospital. I had to shower there since I was covered in God knows what bacteria and disease that filled that house. I, fortunately, never got sick and aside from the mental trauma that night, ended up completely fine. Emily was put in some sort of group home or mental hospital or something and her house was condemned and eventually torn down. I haven't heard much about her since other than the fact that she's still in there. I can't help but feel somewhat guilty for what happened that night. If we had just left her alone, she never would have been put in the position where she'd be tased or hurt in any way, but I also can't help but feel like we helped her by getting her out of that house and it led to her getting the mental help she clearly needed. It's something that's been on my mind constantly. It's definitely the worst Halloween I ever had, and by far, the scariest. I worked at a laundromat. That's already scary enough in itself. We do laundry service here, and you don't want to know the stuff I've seen. The stuff customers have the audacity to bring in here when the only solution would be to burn what they bring in. More often than you'd think, we have to tell people to come back to pick up their dirty laundry because we just can't wash it, or we won't. They always come and end up washing the stuff in our washers anyway, but hey, if I don't have to touch the stuff, whatever. Now the story I'm about to tell you is one that still confuses me to this day. It was Halloween 2007. We were supposed to close early, but... My boss ended up telling me to stay late because he thought being the only laundromat open on Halloween night sounded like a good business opportunity. I don't think he would have thought that if he was the one that had to stay there though. So instead of closing at 6pm, we were going to close at 11pm. I was promised double overtime so I was all for it. 
My boss left around 7, gave me the keys and told me to lock up before I left. I really thought it would be a super slow night, but it wasn't. A lot of older folks came in to do their laundry. They said they were grateful for the late hours on Halloween since it meant that there would be fewer kids in the store than usual. By 10pm everyone was gone and I didn't expect anyone else to come in that night. About 20 minutes before closing a man came in. He was wearing torn up dirty clothes and reeked of alcohol and I think weed. I tried not to judge though and told him that he wouldn't have time to dry his stuff before we closed, but he was still welcome to use the washer if he didn't mind taking his wet clothes with him. I would have stayed longer for him to dry his clothes, but I promised my husband that I'd be home early enough to help put the kids to bed and Eleven was already pushing it. I didn't really know what to think when he pulled out blood-soaked clothing from the black trash bag he was carrying. And when I say blood-soaked, I don't mean dried blood. I mean, when this guy pulled the clothes out of the bag, they were sopping wet and dripping with blood. I was staring at him wide-eyed. He must have noticed because he turned to me and asked if we had any bleach and that he was a butcher and those were his work clothes. He bought some bleach and all I could say back to him was, mm-hmm. His clothes smacked against the sides of the washer as he loaded them in and I watched the water and soap turn dark red as the machine swirled the clothes around. When the buzzer finally went off, signaling the cycle was over, I was relieved. He'd chosen the quick cycle, so it was only around 10 past when he was done and I was excited to go home. But when he pulled the clothes out, they weren't even close to being clean. He came up to the counter and asked, well, actually begged, to please let him run them again. That meant another 30 minutes of me being there with this really sketchy guy washing gallons of blood out of his clothes, but I felt like I couldn't say no. I didn't buy the butcher's story and asked him again what all the blood was from and this time actually got a different story. He said that he wasn't actually a butcher and just used that as an excuse. He said it was actually fake blood that he bought from the Halloween store for a prank that he was playing on his buddies that night. He slipped and got it all over himself instead. I didn't buy that either, but I didn't want him to know that so I agreed to let him run them through again. He restarted the washer after adding more bleach and the water ran clear this time. He asked if I wanted to hear a scary story and God knows I didn't, but again, thought saying no to this man wasn't an option, so I just said sure. And here's what he said. A man was walking in an alleyway at night when he got this urge, an urge he'd been feeling on and off for years. He always held back and learned to ignore it, but this time, he couldn't. He wouldn't. He had to give in. He had to satisfy this craving he'd been having. It felt like if he didn't, he would die. His soul would die. What was this urge? It was the urge to kill. The man had experimented with death since childhood. He would dissect dead animals he found and became weirdly fascinated by serial killers in the way they thought. He related to them. He even wanted to be like them sometimes. Well, the pre-prison version of them at least. Killing animals was fine, but it was never enough. When he got into his later adult years and got a job, moving up a level was all he ever thought about. He found himself in that alleyway, fully prepared to go up to that level. He just didn't know exactly how. He didn't have a plan or know where to go, who to look for. He just knew that was the night. He walked through downtown and saw a woman standing on the corner. She was obviously a call girl, and he asked her if he could buy her services and if they could go step into an alley since he had nowhere else to take her. She agreed and they walked together into the darkness. As he walked behind her, he saw an old rusty metal pipe laying on the ground beside a dumpster. He picked it up and hit her in the back of the head with it. He hit her so hard she fell to the ground completely unconscious. Her head began oozing blood, and he'd never seen so much blood come out of the human body before and he was entranced by it. He sat down next to her and put his hands in the blood, rubbing it all over his face and clothes. He picked her up and laid her head into his lap and watched the blood drain over his body. The feeling he got was like no other. It was like something he couldn't even describe. I told him to stop telling me the story since it was grossing me out and really scaring me and thankfully he did. Before I knew it, the buzzer to the machine went off again and he was loading his pink wet clothes into his bag and heading out the door. I was a little scared to leave after him but I just wanted to get home. I grabbed my things, 
locked up and rushed quickly to my car in the night. The next day when I went to open the laundromat in the morning, there were officers waiting for me, and I instantly knew why. There could be no other explanation. When they asked me if a man came in with bloody clothes the night before and I told them everything. I asked how they knew he came in, and they said that they were able to follow him on security cameras and street cams and saw him come into the laundromat from the camera across the street. It turns out the story he told me was true, and it was of course about him. Thankfully, the woman he had obviously tried to murder narrowly survived after someone found her lying there not long after she was hit. She lost a lot of blood from her skull area and was on life support, but was expected to recover in time. They still haven't found the guy, terrifyingly enough, and thank God I haven't seen him since. There have been no other instances similar to that, so I don't know if he's attempted anything again. I keep a lookout in the news and pray he never tries to hurt anyone again even though with what he said, I know he probably will. I'm scared for anyone who has to face that evil man. I don't know what I would do if I saw him again, but I do know one thing. I'll never, ever work late on Halloween night at a laundromat, ever again. I want to start off by saying I'm not one of those people that thinks kids shouldn't have candy on Halloween. Growing up, I even hated the people who would hand out apples and pretzels. It was always such a bummer. But one year, I was working so much that I forgot to get candy until literally the day of, and when I went to the store to get some, there wasn't any left. The only thing left was some stupid pretzels and the ghost spider in web shapes. I mentally screamed at myself, but I had no other choice to get those and hand them out tonight when kids would eventually be coming by. Throughout the whole night, every time I handed out the pretzels, I apologized to the kids and told them next year I'd have full-size candy bars. No one seemed to be upset by the pretzels, and some kids even told me that they were happy to get pretzels, but I think they were just saying that to be nice. It was all fine and dandy until around 10 p.m. I opened the door to a group of teenage boys who were not at all pleased with what I had to give them. I was surprised that they actually had the audacity to complain and call me a fat loser for giving them pretzels instead of candy. One of them even demanded I give them money for ruining their Halloween and not having the good stuff. After around the fifth insult, I just shut my door. I heard one of them kick it as they were leaving and one of them shouted, you'll regret this. They were just stupid kids though. I didn't think they'd actually do anything to me just because one of the many houses they went to gave them pretzels. I turned my porch lights off to signal that I was done handing out stuff for the night and went and sat on the sofa to watch scary movies and eat some popcorn as the night rolled on. A couple of hours later as I was watching the original Halloween movie, I heard a crashing sound coming from the front door. I went to see what it was and I found a rock with a note tied to it that said, do you regret it now? Believe it or not I actually chuckled a little because it was so cheesy and set the rock and note down on the kitchen counter as I went to get a tarp to cover the window so no rain could get in, as we were expecting a small storm the next day. Obviously, I was livid. When I came back into the room with the tarp, I heard another crashing sound coming from the bedroom on the other side of the house. Again, there was a rock with another note that said, You fat pig, we'll kill you. This time, I felt my stomach sink, and there was no chuckle. This isn't fun anymore. I picked up my phone and called the police who told me that they were really busy that night and it might be a little while until someone could come out there. She told me to call back if the situation escalated, but if no one was actually harming me, they couldn't make what was happening to me a priority over anyone else who was calling them that night. They were very low staffed. So, I put tarps on both the windows and sat back down to just try and enjoy the rest of the movie, I guess, but... I just couldn't. The whole time I was thinking about what the note said and the fact that I was just a sitting duck with my windows broken in like that. I heard my car alarm go off next, but I wasn't about to open the door to go outside and see what was going on. Instead, I headed upstairs and looked out my bedroom window. The windshield had been completely smashed in and the rest of the car didn't look much better. All I could think about was how these kids must be certifiably insane 
to do this over some stupid pretzels. All at once, bricks and stones came crashing through every window in my house. One narrowly missed my head as it passed through the window that I was looking out of. Glass was flying in every direction, and I was screaming as the sound of every window breaking was almost too much to bear. I had started to become scared for my life, so I grabbed the phone and called the police again to tell them that they needed to get there immediately. I saw the neighbors come outside to see what the noise was and I yelled for them to call the police and get back inside. I rushed downstairs to get out of the house and take refuge with one of the neighbors, but that was never going to happen. At the bottom of the stairs was the same group of kids from earlier, the same kids who had been terrorizing me that night. Only this time, they were holding bats and rope. I rushed back into my bedroom and locked the door behind me, but that didn't stop them. They broke through the door like it was nothing and rushed towards me, screaming like they were going into battle or something. They beat me while screaming insults and laughing. I remember laying there and becoming numb to every blow that came across my body and the laughing is what disturbed me the most. They were enjoying what they were doing, and eventually, all I saw was black. The police arrived some time later to find me curled up in the fetal position on my bedroom floor, bruised and bloodied. They called an ambulance that took me to the hospital, and I ended the night with eight broken ribs, a broken collarbone, torn ligaments, multiple lacerations to my body, a fractured eye socket and fractured skull. They told me with the beating I got I was lucky to have survived with no internal injuries or major brain damage. I spent a couple of months in the hospital and had to move in with my mother during my recovery. Thankfully, those idiots were stupid enough to brag about what they did in school. They must have bragged to the wrong person because one of the people they told ended up going to the police with the information. All in all, eight boys between the age ranges of 14 to 17 were arrested and charged with home invasion and attempted murder, as well as assault with a deadly weapon. They were all tried as adults and their sentences ranged from 12 to 25 years. Some made deals to talk about what had happened to get lighter sentences, and I was relieved that they got the time they did. I had little hope when they were originally arrested since they were all minors. I have fully recovered and the only lasting injury I have has been PTSD from that night. All in all, I'm just glad I'm alive today, able to tell the story. Safe to say, I don't hand out pretzels anymore. I don't hand out anything. I refuse to answer my door on Halloween night, and I don't want to risk angering the wrong kids and possibly repeat the scariest night of my entire life. It was Halloween night, 2013. I was 13 years old and had just had a really awesome night with friends trick-or-treating. We figured it would be the last time we got to trick-or-treat together before we got too old. We all lived within a few streets of each other and on our way back we'd walk each other home. I was the last person left walking alone after we got to Jackie's house and she went inside. She offered to have me stay the night but I knew my mom wanted me home since it was a school night. The town we lived in was small enough that none of our parents made a big deal out of us going out alone on Halloween, and we were just happy we wouldn't be embarrassed by one of our parents following us around all night. After I watched Jackie shut the door behind her, I started walking down the street, hoping I'd get back before curfew at 10pm. It was usually at 9, but my mom made an exception for Halloween, which I was supremely grateful for. As I was walking down the dimly lit road, I started hearing a sound coming from the bushes right beside me. I looked, but without a flashlight I couldn't see anything. I picked up the pace, but the sound followed. It was like a growling noise, and no matter how much I convinced myself I was brave, in that moment, I felt like a little girl who needed her dad to come and save her. At some point, my fast walking turned into an all-out sprint. I heard branches snapping and the growling turned to barking and by the time I made it to the end of the road, I realized what was following me was a very large, incredibly intimidating dog. It looked like a pit bull, but what scared me the most was its size and the fact that it was baring all of its teeth and growling at me through the very short fence separating us. It was like we both had this moment of realization where we noticed the height of the fence at the same time. I kid you not. I swear this dog and I locked eyes like we both knew what it was about to do. 
I screamed at it over and over again as I backed away slowly. No, 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 don't. Like this dog could understand me or something, but of course. The dog very easily, as if it was nothing to him, ran and jumped over the fence and rushed towards me. I began running, but of course I was no match for the dog. I did the only thing I could think of and hopped on a nearby car and screamed for help. I don't know if anybody heard me or everyone just thought it was a Halloween prank, but no one came to help me. The dog was jumping along the side of the car that I was on top of, and I was literally praying to God the car alarm would go off and the owner would come outside to see what was going on and maybe call for help. But no, just my luck. The car alarm never went off and I was stuck. I was crying and praying that my family would notice that I was late coming home and they would find me. I was prepared to wait on that car all night. That is until the dog discovered that he could just hop into the truck bed to get closer to me. It jumped right in and before I knew it, I was sliding off the car and being chased by the dog along the road yet again. The cape I was wearing started to slow me down and with it being tied around my neck, I felt like I was choking. I pulled it off and threw it toward the dog running behind me, but it flew right past it. I saw a tree I thought would be easy enough to climb and decided to take my chances. I ran full speed at the tree and, like I was George of the Jungle or something, I made my way at least ten feet up this tree in seconds. The dog was at the base of the tree still lunging toward me, but I was safe for the time being. I did have my priorities pretty straight at thirteen though. I was clutching onto my bag of candy all the way up that tree. I was prepared to wear that grocery bag as a backpack if I needed to to make sure not one piece of candy was lost. I sat up in that tree for what felt like at least an hour while the dog waited for me to slow down. After around ten minutes of me being up there, it stopped barking and just sat there, staring at me, waiting. I knew it would be a bit before my parents would realize I wasn't home, so I just started eating the candy and staring back at the dog. I started thinking about how I honestly felt a little sad for the dog. I knew my parents would make a big deal about this and they'd demand something be done about the dog and I really didn't want that to happen. Right then and there I decided I was going to do whatever it took to get out of that situation myself to save that dog whatever life of misery was awaiting it if my parents knew what happened to me that night. Part of me thought just jumping down and running as fast as I could to my house would do the trick. But then I remembered that dog was way faster than me and the couple times I'd outrun it were just straight luck. There had to be another way. I sat there for at least another ten minutes trying to come up with a plan until I finally thought of something. The tree I was in looked right over a fence into someone's backyard, and right over the fence was a window that I was hoping was the bedroom. I thought if I threw the whole bag of candy bunched into a ball at the window that maybe the people would wake up come outside and distract the dog long enough for me to run away without it noticing. I was sad to do it, but this dog's life meant more to me than candy, even if it had terrorized me all night. I also figured maybe these people would be nicer when deciding what should happen to the dog than my parents, so to me it was a win-win. I settled all the candy at the bottom of the cheap plastic grocery bag and tied it closed so it was in a tight ball. I took a deep breath and threw it as hard as I could against that window. Unfortunately, for the homeowners, the window actually shattered. But unfortunately for me, the crash did wake the people inside and they came out. The second their door opened, the dog was running away from the tree and toward them, and I took that as an opportunity to climb down and start running home. I was able to make it home in just under five minutes, to cop cars in front of my house. I guess my parents had noticed I hadn't come home on time. I was three hours past curfew and my dad did go out looking for me, and he must not have seen me way up in that tree. I had no choice but to tell them what had happened since they got the police involved, but when they went looking for the dog, apparently they couldn't find it. The couple whose window I broke told the police it ran off when they went back inside their house and my parents, of course, had to pay for the damage I caused to their home. They never found the dog and honestly part of me was relieved. I know some people may be thinking that the dog deserved to be found and taken care of, but I'm just one of those people that believe it's not the dog's fault, but the owner's. I would say that there was a moral to this story, but there really wasn't. It was completely random and unavoidable in my eyes, and I'm just glad that I was able to climb that tree.
Halloween isn't my favorite night of the year, actually far from it. But I put up with all the decorations in my house and scary movies all October long because my wife, Laura, absolutely adores the holiday and I'll do anything to make her happy. Every year we hand out candy to the neighborhood kids and she and I dress up in cheesy couples costumes. It's fun for her and I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy it at all. The neighborhood we live in is extremely nice. My wife and I are both lawyers and we do pretty well for ourselves, so when it was time to buy a house together, we made sure to get exactly what we wanted. Now on Halloween of 2009, Laura and I were dressed as Sam and Frodo from Lord of the Rings. She insisted and I thought it was hilarious. We even dressed up our baby as Gollum. We were handing out candy as usual and seeing what all the kids in the neighborhood were dressed as was pretty fun. We'd never had any trouble before while handing out candy, but this night would prove to be very, very different. At around 9pm, Laura answered the door and instead of hearing trick or treat, she was met with a young boy, maybe 8 or 9, crying on our doorstep. She knelt down and was asking him what was wrong, but he wasn't talking much. In between sobs, he would say that he was lost and that he needed water. Laura tried asking him where his parents were, but he wouldn't answer. She brought him inside and took him back into the kitchen to get some water. She motioned for me to follow her into the living room and when I did, she told me that she was going to call the police. I told her that was a good idea but we should also wait for the boy to calm down a bit and then ask him if he knows his parents' phone number as well. After our talk, Laura and I walked back into the kitchen and the boy wasn't sitting at the counter anymore. He was standing at the back door. Both of us thought nothing of it, maybe he just wanted to look outside. We sat him at the table and asked him what his parents' phone number was or if there was anyone we could call to come and get him. He had finally stopped crying and told us he didn't know his parents' phone number, but he did know his brother's. He made the call and within 15 minutes, his brother was at our door, sweaty and obviously worried. He told us he'd been out trick-or-treating with his brother and looked away for a second and he was gone. He thanked us more than he needed to and we watched as they walked down the road out of sight. I mentioned to my wife how his brother looked like nothing like him and was definitely way older than 14, the age that he said he was. We contemplated still calling the police just to tell them what happened but eventually decided against it when our little golem baby started crying and we realized that we had already had enough on our plates. The boy was with his brother now and he'd be fine. Laura was still worried so I spent the next few hours reassuring her everything would be okay and that we did our part by helping the boy when he needed it. By midnight, my wife and I lay down for bed with our baby in his crib beside our bed. Laura kept talking about how successful the night was, but she still felt a little uneasy about the boy we'd helped earlier. I started to become somewhat irritated by her bringing it up and that I eventually just told her I didn't want to talk about it anymore and that the situation was done and over with. But boy, was I wrong. At around 3 in the morning, my wife woke me up. She told me that she heard something downstairs and she felt like someone was in the house. Just as she said that, I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the stairs. I whispered to Laura to take the baby into the bathroom that was attached to our bedroom and to lock the door. I went into our closet and shut the door behind me. It took me a second to remember the code to the safe but sighed a sigh of relief when I finally got it open. I took my handgun out and tried to stay as quiet as possible. I was hoping my wife had brought her phone into the bathroom with her and was calling the police. I opened the door to the closet just enough to be able to see out toward the door that led from our bedroom into the hallway. I watched as a man in a really horrifying clown mask opened the door and came right into the room. He walked toward the bathroom and tried the handle and that was all I needed to see. I slowly opened the closet door to not alert the man of my presence as I pointed the gun at his head. In a more shaky voice than I would have wanted, I said, Stop. I'm calling the police. You need to leave. I don't think he realized I was pointing a gun right at him because he turned around very quickly like he was going to attack me or something, but the second he saw what I was holding, he froze in his place. My back was to the door, which was a little stupid of me. I had assumed the guy was alone, but I learned quickly that wasn't the case. Behind me, I heard someone clear their throat and tell me to put the gun down. I glanced in the direction the voice came from and to my shock, the boy from earlier was standing right behind me, 
pointing a gun at me instead. My mind was racing. I knew if I put the gun down I'd have nothing to protect myself or my wife and child. I always knew I would risk my life for my family and I couldn't let them down by giving it to this man and child. In that moment, I decided there really was only one option, and it all counted on one thing, that the kid wasn't as confident as he seemed. I shot the man in the leg, and as he collapsed to the floor, I turned around and tackled the kid, wrestling the gun out of his hand. Thankfully, I was right. I figured if I shot the guy, the kid would be way too shocked and scared to actually get a shot off at me. My wife was screaming in the bathroom, asking if I was okay, and she started screaming when she heard me say that I was fine. The police were there only five minutes later since my wife had been on the phone with them from the moment she got into the bathroom. Turns out, the boy who we let into our house earlier that night unlocked our back door for his father to come in later to rob the place. I was right too when I said his brother looked way older. It's because it was really his dad who had sent him into our house to make it accessible to him later in the night. The father was charged with home invasion and ended up getting 18 years in prison, and thank God he's still in there now. The boy, his son, was put into the care of his mother who was actually in the middle of trying to get full custody of him due to his father's criminal background and inability to properly take care of him. Laura and I moved out of that house a month later and we moved in with her parents for a while before finding another home. We just didn't feel safe in that house after then. Our son is 13 years old now and thankfully was too young to remember what happened that night. Laura and I still remember though, and we make sure to lock all of our doors and windows every night before we go to sleep. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Halloween is one of my favorite nights of the year, even now as an adult it's fun. Being a kid, though, is the absolute best time to celebrate the most awesome holiday of the year. I try my best not to think about the night I'm about to write about, but my therapist told me putting the words on the page and maybe even sharing it with people may help me move on. So here I am, trying my best to move on from a night that has caused me endless nightmares and paranoia. I hope some of you can understand why I was left so traumatized. I was 16 years old. For reference, I'm a 5'2", very small woman, and I've been the same height since I was 15 and wish every day I would grow a few inches. This Halloween, my friends decided we were too old to trick or treat, which was disappointing for me to hear, so when we were trying to figure out what to do instead, my friend Jennifer suggested that we hang out with her boyfriend and his friends. They were going to walk around scaring kids and doing other dumb stuff that I really didn't want to be a part of. But I was told that I had to go, otherwise one of the guys wouldn't have a girl to hang out, then I'd be selfish if I skipped out. So, I agreed. We were all still going to be in costume, and that year I had chosen to be Buffy from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Mostly because that meant that I could dress in a cute outfit and not be uncomfortable all night like I knew Jennifer would be in her sexy bunny costume. I mean, come on, we were teenagers. No one should have ever sold her that costume. Anyways... I met up with my friend and the guys and we set off on our walk around the city. I have to admit, it was unbelievably boring. I noticed over the years less and less kids would go out trick-or-treating on Halloween. So the plan the guys had of scaring kids, I guess, wasn't seeming like it was going to work out. I was relieved considering I didn't want to force any mental trauma on kids in a night where all they wanted to do was have fun, as I wanted to as well. We made our way to the house of an older guy that I guess Jennifer's boyfriend didn't like very much. He said that he was just going to ding-dong ditch the guy and we'd run, but of course, that didn't end up being the case. We walked in front of the house and he picked up a rock and threw it through the man's window. He told us to run and as we were making our way away from the house, I looked back and noticed a figure in the front window that had just been broken. It was someone wearing a Michael Myers costume from the movie Halloween. Creepy, yeah, but it was Halloween, so I just figured it was coincidental. As we reached the end of the street, we slowed down and I took a deep breath before yelling at Jen's boyfriend for the stunt that he just pulled. 
Then he mentioned how he also saw Michael Myers in the window and that the guy living there must have really been a freak since he obviously was just wearing it in his house when there were no kids out trick-or-treating. Everyone laughed about it, but I swear when I looked back toward the house, I saw him standing on the lawn, still as a board, staring at us. I turned around to tell the group and just like the movie when everyone went to look, he was gone. I will say, the movie Halloween was always one that scared me pretty bad, so the thought of someone who looked exactly like the psycho in that movie, watching us, wasn't exactly the greatest feeling in the world. When we turned the corner out of the neighborhood, I couldn't help but to keep looking back, fully expecting him to be there following us, but he wasn't. We stopped at McDonald's a few minutes later and got stuff to eat and sat at one of the tables outside. I was enjoying my fries when... I looked up toward the movie theater across the street, and there he was, standing under the light in the front almost like he wanted me to see him. This time, I didn't take my eyes off of him and when I pointed him out to the others. Jen's boyfriend yelled out to him that he was a creep and to leave us alone, but staying in character, he said nothing and just tilted his head as though he was confused. It didn't take long for him to discontinue his statue-like posture as he began to slowly make his way toward us. Jen's boyfriend was screaming at him to stay back, but once he was halfway across the parking lot, I think we all just got scared enough that we all just started running away. Jen ran in one direction with her boyfriend and the other two guys ran with them. My friend Jane thankfully decided to come with me as we ran into the nearby neighborhood. After a few blocks passed, we came to a halt and between gas made a plan to get to her house as fast as possible, and if either of us saw the guy again, we let each other know so we could continue running if need be. We walked for around ten minutes and saw nothing. Well, except a few kids trick-or-treating here and there. We were walking down a street when a kid coming from a house just ahead pointed behind us and said, Whoa, cool Michael Myers costume, man. Jane and I looked at each other before quickly turning around only to be met with the terrifying realization that he was walking only five feet behind us. Both of us screamed and took off running toward Jane's house, this time not stopping for anything. We burst into the house and through our tears explained to Jane's mom what was going on. We told her everything, about Jen's boyfriend throwing the rock into the guy's house, which she did not like and planned on reporting, and about the guy who had been following us all night. She actually thought it was funny that he was following us. She said we deserved it for what we did to the guy's house. We sat on the sofa after getting into our PJs and Jane's mom called mine to make sure I could spend the night. When she came back in the room she was laughing and said our friend was standing on the sidewalk outside and that we should just say hi. We were confused. Terror ran through us as we peeked out the window and there he was, standing there, staring right back at us and we looked at him. Jane's mom was somehow still laughing as we started to cry again, telling her it really wasn't funny and we were scared. When she realized it wasn't a joke to us and that we were actually upset, she got her husband to go outside and tell him to leave. He actually did approach the guy, and the guy just walked off. We thought that that would be the end of it, but it wasn't. After Jane and I had gone into her room to sleep, we talked about how awful the night had been and how much we wished that we could go back and undo it. Jane had changed the subject and was talking about a boy she liked when we heard a knock at her window. We absolutely were not about to look at who it was. We weren't that stupid. So instead, we went and got Jane's dad and he walked with us back into Jane's room to look. He pulled back the curtains and there he was, the man in the Michael Myers costume standing just outside Jane's window staring in. He was completely unfazed by her father being there. He just stared right at Jane and I. We screamed and ran out of the room and watched as her father stormed out of the house to confront the man. Her mom told us to go into her bedroom with her as she called the police. When they arrived and arrested the man, they told us the man in the costume wasn't the old man whose house was vandalized by Jen's boyfriend. In fact, he didn't know the guy at all. When they went to check the house, they found the man inside, strangled to death. The guy who had been following us had murdered him and eventually confessed he planned to do the same to us. He just didn't expect a man bigger than him to be in the home with us. He was sentenced to life in prison, so thankfully I don't have to worry about him ever getting out and hurting me, but that night still haunts me. 
I hope one day I can find peace and be able to move on from what happened that night. Maybe someday I will. I do still love Halloween. The day, not the movie. Halloween night on a boat. It doesn't seem like the best way to spend your night, but my boyfriend wanted to go and I'm terrible at saying no to him. We were supposed to be in costume, but I was already dreading the night without having to be in an uncomfortable, probably itchy outfit all night. I was just going to make my boyfriend happy, but the night ended up very different than we had planned or than I had hoped. We arrived at the docks about 30 minutes early to make sure we got a spot on the boat. They were selling tickets right then and there, so if you showed up too late, you wouldn't be able to go. We got on board and it was packed. People were already drunk and acting like idiots and I was not at all excited for the night to come. I've always been an introvert and my boyfriend at the time was extremely extroverted. Pretty much the opposites attract thing, I guess. Looking back now, he should have understood how uncomfortable that night would make me and we could have compromised and done something both of us would enjoy. But with him, it was all about what he wanted. Most of the night, I spent sitting at a table, waiting for it to be over. My boyfriend ditched me the second he saw one of his friends was there. It was proving to just be a horrible night. We were a mile off the coast and I had nowhere else to go. Then, to make things worse, the boat suddenly stopped. The lights went out and the music stopped. People started to boo like it was done on purpose, but I knew that there was something wrong. I started asking the crew what was going on, but they didn't know either. Drunk, bored people are the worst people to be around. A bunch of them thought it would be funny to run from side to side to try and sway the boat. It rocked a little, but there wasn't much success. The captain came out and made an announcement that they were trying to get help from the Coast Guard, but weren't having much luck getting through to anyone and told us that we might be there a while. It started getting cold and I couldn't find my boyfriend anywhere. It was so dark, all I could see was the glow sticks people were wearing and the occasional phone screen light up. I sat down toward the front of the boat and all I could do was wait. And that's when a man sat beside me. He put his arm around me and, with alcohol in his breath, asked me why I was sitting there all alone. I shoved his arm off of me and stood up to walk away, but he didn't like that. He grabbed me by my wrist and pulled me back down so hard I thought my tailbone had broken when I hit the metal deck. He laughed and told me that I'd be staying with him for the rest of the night. I was scared and confused, but I knew the night would be over soon enough. The fear I had almost made me not able to move, so I sat there with that man as he held on to me. My boyfriend finally found me and asked me what I was doing with another guy. I tried telling him what happened, but he didn't believe me. He actually thought that I was cheating on him, and instead of helping me, he just ends up walking away. I was immediately devastated. This only made the guy who was holding me think that I was his to keep for good. He said that because I was single now, I was his and even had the audacity to tell me that I'd be going home with him tonight because he said so. I stood up again trying to get away from this psychopath, but this time he joined me. He stood up next to me and grabbed me by the waist and whispered in my ear, You try to get away from me again, I'll make sure you never get off this boat. My heart started to race. I knew this was a situation I wasn't meant to be in. There had to be a way to get away from this man. We were walking through the crowds when I decided to make a run for it. I shoved him away from me and ran through the sea of people in front of me, eyes wide so I didn't run into anything that would slow me down. I found the woman's restroom and when I ran in crying, the other woman inside asked me what was wrong. I told him about the guy who had been following me and when he came in through the door looking for me, None of the women comforting me hesitated even a second to jump on top of him, tackling him to the ground. It was so dark I couldn't see exactly what was happening, but his groaning and screaming made it obvious whatever they were doing didn't feel good. I listened and watched as much as I could while they punched and kicked him until he was unconscious. As they were dragging him out of the bathroom, the lights turned back on and everyone turned to look. It must have been a sight to see since everyone gasped when they saw him. He looked worse than I thought. He could only see so much in the darkness, but when the lights came back on, it was easy to see the damage they had done to him. His face had become barely recognizable and his clothes were torn almost completely off. His body was red from the beating. He'd obviously have bruises the next morning. 
The captain had gotten a hold of the Coast Guard and the police by using someone's cell phone, and he made sure that we arrived at the docks as fast as possible to get the guy some medical treatment since he obviously needed it. The police were there to meet us when we arrived, and I, along with the women who kicked the life out of him, were questioned on what happened. Other people who witnessed him holding me down backed up my story. What really concerned me, though, was the fact that they had seen me struggling, sitting there with that guy, noticed it was a problem, and still did nothing. The man was put in custody after leaving the hospital and was charged with harassment. He only received 90 days and a small fine of $400. He was also ordered to stay away from me and not to contact me at all. He never admitted to what he did. He denied everything and said that I made it all up to make him look bad. He even threatened to sue me for a while there. There were enough witnesses though and that everything I said about what happened was proven to be true. I broke up with my boyfriend the night after the boat party and haven't spoken to him since for obvious reasons. More than anything, I'm just grateful for those women who saved me. They knew I was in trouble and didn't hesitate to help me. I'm actually still friends with most of them and every Halloween, we go out together and we all have each other's backs if we need it. This is going to sound a little bit far-fetched, but I wouldn't be telling it if it wasn't true. It was by far the most terrifying night of my life that I will remember forever. I was 17 years old and just coming to terms with realizing that I'm gay. I won't go too much into that, but it's relevant to the story. I had just tearfully come out to my parents who thankfully accepted me. The day before Halloween, I came out to my group of friends. A few of them looked at me funny when I told them, but the majority were proud of me and hugged me. I was overwhelmed with the amount of love I received during a time of extreme insecurity for me. Well, the next day at school, we were talking about what we should do that night for Halloween. A few people were having parties we could go to, or it was suggested that we go over to one of our houses and watch scary movies. I just had a weird and intense couple of days, so I wasn't too stoked about going out, but my friends were adamant that I join them and have fun being the person I was hiding for so long, as they said. I was happy to have their support, so I agreed. We went to a party and everyone was so welcoming and great to me. It was like nothing had changed and I was so happy. We left the party at around 2am and one of our friends, Dylan, suggested that we head into the woods to the old abandoned farmhouse. It's one of those places teenagers go to party or get high so we'd all been there before. Only now it was at night and I really just wanted to get home. Most of our friend group declined, but when I tried, Dylan kept telling me I needed to go, that he was having so much fun with me and that we'd have a lot of fun. I looked over towards my best friend Danielle and told her I'd go if she did. Danielle agreed, which meant that we were quickly on our way to the farmhouse. We got there relatively quickly and were inside the building by around 3 a.m. It was pretty structurally sound still and wasn't falling apart by any means, so I felt safe in that regard at the very least. Dylan reached into his backpack and pulled out a Ouija board and started doing this dumb, evil laugh. There were five of us there and he asked who wanted to play. I'm a pretty superstitious person so there was no way I was touching that thing. Danielle and the others agreed to play while I watched. Dylan was asking some stupid questions like, will I get laid tonight and when am I going to die? It was all really dumb and you could tell that he was moving the piece by himself to get the answer he wanted. I mean, the answer he got to when will I die was a date like 500 years in the future and he started bragging about how he was an eternal being or some stupid stuff. I tapped Danielle on the shoulder and told her that we should just leave and was surprised when she told me she didn't want to and was actually having fun. I stood around there for another hour before the others finally wanted to leave. As we were walking out of the farmhouse... Dylan stopped me as the rest of the group kept walking and told me he had left his backpack inside and asked if I could go get it. I didn't see why not so I ran back in, grabbed the backpack and just as I was heading for the door, I watched as Dylan slammed it shut. I tried opening it back up, but something was obviously blocking it from opening. The rest of the house was boarded shut. I was trapped with no way out. I tried my cell phone but just as expected it had no service. I started shouting for him to let me out, but he was just laughing and calling me slurs. 
He told me I didn't deserve to live and he had hoped I'd die in there. And this was exactly what I was afraid of. This is why I kept it to myself for so long. It was the late 2000s, so being gay was more acceptable than in the past, but the people who hated us really hated us. I started crying and screaming for help, but we were at least half a mile into the woods and there was no way anyone would hear me. I didn't know if Dylan was standing outside, but it didn't matter. I couldn't count on him to let me out. Around 20 minutes went by and I heard a noise upstairs. It sounded like footsteps. I started to panic. And I got this feeling like something was watching me. It was almost completely dark in the house since I wasn't given a flashlight before coming inside and my eyes hadn't adjusted to the darkness. The footsteps got louder and I crawled into the corner of the room and scrunched down as much as possible so maybe I wouldn't be seen. I listened as whatever it was made its way down the stairs and closer to me. I had my head shoved into my arms and no matter what I told myself I wouldn't look up. I began to shake as the sound stopped right in front of me and I could hear the breathing of whoever it was standing over me. It's not nice to summon demons in someone's house. I wasn't expecting a voice so when I heard it, I instinctively looked up. It was very obviously a homeless man with ratty clothes and matted hair. He smelled horrible and I almost screamed when I saw him. I I'm sorry sir, my friends were doing that, it wasn't me, I'm really sorry. I looked up at him as I spoke. I didn't dare stand up. I didn't want to get any closer to this man than I already was. Why are you in my house? Kids are always coming in here and I hate it. I don't come to your house and summon demons. He sounded relatively calm, but there was an anger in his voice that I was picking up on just slightly. I, I would leave, but one of the guys I was with locked me in. How can I get out? Please, I just want to go home. That's when he smiled, this creepy, mostly toothless smile and told me, uh, you're not going home. You're mine now. I'll keep you as an offering for all the times people have come and vandalize this place. My heart started to race and I got up as quickly as possible and shoved my way past him, knocking him to the floor in the scuffle. I ran up the stairs and wanted to scream and cry as I heard him barrel his way after me, screaming that I belonged to him now. I ran into one of the bedrooms and was grateful to see an open window I thought I could escape from. I looked down and noticed the jump was too far to the ground and when I looked back and saw the man in the doorway, I had no other choice. I jumped. I landed hard on my feet and was pretty sure that I had broken something, but the adrenaline and shock kept me going. I got up and started running. I wasn't going very fast, but what mattered was that I was getting out of there. I made my way home and knocked loudly until my mom came to the door. I lost my keys in the fall and was just happy to be in my own home, hugging my mom, knowing that I was safe. She asked me what was wrong and what happened to me, but I was crying too much to say anything. She told me to take a shower and to calm down and then we could talk. I washed off all the dirt and muck from my body and began feeling the searing pain coming from my ankle. I got out of the shower got dressed and told my mom we needed to go to the hospital since I think I definitely had broken something. On the way there, I told her everything. She even started to cry. Not just because she was upset, but because she was so sad that I had to experience something like that just because of who I am. I did end up having a broken ankle and wore a cast for like two months or something. My mom called the police on Dylan and reported him to the school. He wasn't arrested or charged with anything, but he was expelled, which... I was very thankful for. No man was found in the old farmhouse, and it was torn down only about a month later when the owners of the property agreed it garnered too much attention from the wrong crowds and was a safety issue. It's over a decade later now and I still get goosebumps when I think about that night. You'll be happy to know that I've been living very happily as myself for quite some time now. I've been married to an amazing person and we are expecting a son through a surrogate now very soon. I'm happy I'll be able to raise a man who will be a good person. There's just no way he'll be allowed to stay out that late on Halloween night. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, 
and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for this channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links are all in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, you do snot want to get sick.